I welcome all of you to this uh, short webinar. Here we, uh, we are here today to help everyone in uh, filling this form. And the reason that we need this uh, survey is that we in India have so many labs, so many labs, and the patient is always at a loss. Where should I go? And we are attempting to sort of make uh, levels visible to the patient also and to us also for better improvement throughout the, for us meaning all labs, for a better improvement and further improvement. So uh, at the outset, at the, this has been uh, partnered by Roche. Roche has uh, formulated the survey and they're partnering with the CAHO in distributing the survey and collecting the data. And probably this will be the first of its kind from India. I would first like to introduce a very, very esteemed Professor Venkatesh. He is also here on the panel and he is the one who has uh, had this dream for a long time and it is uh, being, it has come forth now. Dr. Venkatesh, all of you know, is, uh, is very well known being a biochemist, but he, his work in quality is so much more and his work on lead and the uh, implementation of uh, guidelines and directives and rules for lead use in the country are remarkable and are the only ones available. He is the one man, lead man, the only lead man of our country. Welcome to you, Dr. Venkatesh. Dr. Richard is uh, from Roche. And he has been very, very active in uh, helping us formulate this whole, uh, he and Dr. Amit have been very, very in active in formulating this whole survey and how to use it and how to analyze it and what people go through. And last of all, Dr. Bernali Das is here. We have many more on the panel, but these are the three who will be taking you forward and handholding and uh, helping you through with the uh, filling of the form. and our other members will also be there to help you through. Bernali is, our, uh, is one of the speakers today and she is going to uh, also going to help you and she is the senior, the biochemist at, um, the senior most biochemist at, the, at uh, Kokila Ben Hospital in Bombay. And she has a lot of work in this area, especially in uh, harmonization of tests. So, over to you, Dr. Richard. Hi, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that introduction. Uh, really would like to welcome Dr. Bernali to the session. Uh, I think there's a lot to, uh, in the first session, I think what we'd be looking at is really understanding what lab benchmarking is all about. I think there's a larger, uh, there's a lot of questions that have come into understand the concept of benchmarking, why we're doing it, and what are the reasons and what are the benefits of doing it. Uh, I would like, I would, uh, with just having said just as little as that, I would really like to invite Dr. Burlani to uh, take us through her understanding of uh, or her presentation, which talks about lab benchmarking and her experience with lab benchmarking. And then we can go forward further into uh, other discussions as the discussion, as the uh, webinar progresses. Thank you so much, Dr. Burlani, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seema and Dr. Richard. Uh, thanks, Dr. Seema, for kind introduction. And uh, thanks, uh, Kahu Diagnostic Division and Ross Diagnostic India Private Limited for actually initiating this survey. And uh, this survey was uh, there in the APEC region since long, I think, more, uh, before 2017, it started. And uh, 2017, it got the momentum and uh, so, and now it is introduced into different countries and India, we are participating. So now I will like, you know, what is benchmarking and why we should do this survey, why we should contribute and participate in this survey. So I'll share my screen. So today I'll discuss about lab insights and lab bench benchmarking in India, a way forward bringing vision into practice. So this is our lab. So uh, like when we participated in this survey, uh, so we start this COVID video. Yeah. 
Santa, he's ready. Who? Senator. I'm not ready for this. Take a deep breath. You have this. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you all right, young lady? They just said that she had a seizure. I've seen this before. The Wall Street guys have been all stressed out. There's nothing wrong with them. It's all in their heads. Her MRI is normal. Her neurological exam is all normal. I'm looking in her eyes, and I can tell she's not there. <laughs> it's New York. I'm so unhappy there. I think, hey, you need to let me I can't. <laughs> Mystery the tests this are saying life. that she is a healthy young woman. How do you explain the seizures? The truth is that we don't know what is wrong with Susanna. I'm going to do everything I can to find you. I've had so many doctors, so many opinions. Who says this guy has all the okay. answers? Okay. Doctor, what do you say? To put it simply, her brain is on fire. I'm so for us, uh, actually, it's all about patience. So benchmarking, any automation, integration, consolidation, digitalization, all about our patient's outcome. So uh, this is one uh, lady, Susanna Kahalan. She's a cub reporter. She told this story, and many of you may have seen this movie, Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness. So she wrote, one day I woke up in a strange hospital room strapped to my bed, under guard and unable to move or speak. Only weeks earlier, I had been a healthy 24-year-old, beginning a career as a cub reporter at the New York Post. As weeks ticked by and I moved inexplicably from violence to catatonia, around $1 million worth of blood test and brain scan revealed nothing. The exhausted doctors were ready to commit me to the psychiatric world, in effect condemning me to a lifetime of institution or death until Dr. Sahil Nazar joined my team. So Dr. Sahil Nazar was the immunologist. So this Dr. Sahil Nazar can be you or me in our hospital or lab set up. So we have neurological journal club. So I remember when we started neuroimmune markers, this is the case of autoimmune encephalitis, NTNMD receptor autoantibodies are the cause for this. So when we started our journey, I remember in the neurological journal club, so we all stakeholders along with the diagnosticians, neurologists, neurosurgeon, then neuroradiologists, we all used to take part and we used to contribute. So ultimately patient outcomes or for us diagnosticians every blood sample tells us a story so this is my painting so here we we have i have shown the like uh, we are, we may be running the samples and auto analyzers like this is the chemistry and immunoassay benchmarking survey so there is molecular diagnostic benchmarking survey so there may be different uh, mo modalities like someone is doing our rt pcr someone is doing some other tests, histopathology, biopsy, and reporting. So uh, here uh, we see the patient sees the clinicians, but if you see this extended hand, that is ours. So we diagnosticians take part very importantly. We are the main stakeholders uh, for contributing to us patient outcomes. So this, if we see uh, the pre-COVID era existing challenges, like where, where we apply for this survey. So we need to understand the different KPIs and key performance indicators. So this, during pre-COVID era, there were existing challenges like process efficiency, operation and workflow, then staff motivations, then clinical capability, patient outcome, then financial part performance, overhead cost burden, then reputation, and then as Seema Mal has state, uh, stated that standardization, harmonization is really a challenge across the network of lab. So we uh, like, uh, under IFCC, I mean, the scientific division executive committee member. And before that, I was in the scientific uh, standardization committee for thyroid function test. So IFCC trying since long for standardization and harmonization of lab tests. And also American Association of Clinical Chemistry, we are trying to standardize and harmonize across the globe. So how we being in a small lab or medium sized lab or a big lab, how each one of us can benchmark ourselves and can take part in this standardization and harmonization journey so this then this is our low role how to contribute and then during the covid navigating lab operation with the covid like we know during the covid time test volume fluctuation lab data management and digitalization 
played a very, very important role. Uh, many times at night, maybe two o'clock, we need to report, uh, release some reports. So we get call from emergency or stat critical reporting. During COVID time, we realize that the role of the digitalization. So we just take a minute to uh, like you know log in and see the reports and uh, interpret the reports and uh, reporting the, that. So then expanding the menu and the first reporting of the critical results. So why many times the critical results reporting and and when we participate in NABH or JCI audit, we see the main part is the clinical audit. Main part is how we report clinical results, how we report point of care testing. So during the COVID time, we realized the role of expanding menu and faster reporting of the critical results. Then coming to the staff safety, uh, staff skill and overall biosafety. So we are doing many uh, like, you know, induction training, other training, but when we are scoring, we see many Many times we are lacking in the scoring. So because of that, if we take part in ben benchmarking kind of survey, we know what KPI we are lacking and how we can monitor that. And the main and major thing what we have seen the change is inventory and supply chain. Supply chain, the codification and inventory through digitalization has like you know, huge, huge role we have seen during the COVID. So this pre-COVID to uh, like you know the COVID and a kind of post-COVID. Now we have seen the change, and this benchmarking can help us to uh, like you know the, uh, this existing challenges. We can actually um, overcome that. So if we see the traditional lab, so traditional lab, like, you know, testing and production around town, around time, four to five hours of reporting. If we see SOP of uh, the traditional lab, so we used to write that the town around time is four to five hours for routine tests, then basic LIS, then staff oversight and training, then quality assurance, early accreditations, and then we used to get complained. And based on that, we used to, rather than feedback based on complaint, we used to take care, we used to do preventive actions and corrective action. Basically, we do corrective action and start preventive action. So this was in the traditional lab. So now the smart core lab or modern clinical lab, we want faster turnaround time. We have faster turnaround time, differentiated service level agreement, then clinician engagement. Now, I think you have seen the collaboration has increased substantially between the clinicians and the diagnosticians. So the clinician engagement is very important in our day-to-day -day practice and then improve satisfactions that uh, NPS score is very important for uh, customer satisfaction or customer feedback, net productivity score, then benchmarking. Benchmarking is a very important tool. Then quality assurance, proactive critical results alerts then lean lab or six sigma increase outreach the outreach so these all kpis are there in our uh, this benchmarking survey so now when we see this kpi and then we apply for this survey and we actually um, participate in this survey we know where we are standing so based on that proactive planning of for the future like what we need speed or efficiency or we need quality errors or safety or we need productivity cost or customer satisfaction best in class lab actually we need everything but we can uh, know based on this kpi survey we know where exactly our lab is so benchmarking, if we see our hospital, our journeys, like we participated in the previous survey also, and now also I have participated. So from traditional lab to the smart core lab, so how benchmarking helped us, like consolidation, integration, and automation. So when we talk about menu, we expanded the menu, discipline-wise integration and consolidation, then workflow integration helped us. Then coming to essay verification and validations, these tools we used to do previously also, but now this with the help of middleware and other software help, we can actually see uh, even we do the workflow sigma metric and also precision. 
and then digitalizations or alerts like acute kidney injury alerts, different other alerts, alerts, algorithm, critical alerts, machine learning based or deep learning based al uh, algorithm. We can integrate digitalization into our day to day practice. So these are the like, you know, how benchmarking can help. So if we see the consolidation, integration, automation, so the speed, efficiency, quality, errors, productivity. So these are different uh, matrices we, we can take care of. Then um, by verification, validation, sigma metric, lean mean implementations like overhead cost, quality can improve. And then digitalization, customer satisfaction, productivity, overhead cost, we can improve by this benchmarking tools. So I believe in the philosophical lines of Albert Einstein. Life is like riding bicycle. To keep balance between these two wheels of the bicycle, we need to keep moving. So if we see these two wheels, one is a wheel of quality, second is a wheel of cost. Wheel of quality depends on in a chemistry lab or even a SLA, lab, we know verification, validation, accuracy, precision, reference interval or cutoff. This play a very significant role. And now coming to the another wheel, wheel that wheel is the cost. Wheel of course depends on three magic M's, man, machine, and material. So when we talk about like, you know, maybe I am in India in a small or medium or big size lab, but how I can standardize and harmonize my lab results with our peer? Maybe someone sitting in Singapore, someone sitting in Europe or US, how I can harmonize our value? So that benchmarking helps us to know where we are lacking and know where we have in, uh, if we have excelled, we are in top 25th percentile. So this benchmarking helps us to decide, like in our case, it helped us to decide consolidation, integration, automation, and digitalization to make that as a part of our life. So this is a short uh, review of this survey. Dr. Richard will give into de uh, give details of the, this survey, but I will I like you know how it helped us as a lab. So I will give you the short review of lab insights and lab benchmarking in India. So uh, uh, as uh, this is the agenda, like what is benchmarking, the benchmarking survey results of the survey, then I will discuss a little bit about the Indian data and the case study of improvement driven by the survey. So this is like, you know, it can take our, uh, I will show you our example, the key study. So according to American Society of Quality, it defines benchmarking as the process of measuring products, services, and processes against those of the organization known to be leaders in one or more aspects of their operation. The purpose of benchmarking is to help organization identify areas, systems, or processes for improvements, either incremental, continuous improvements, or dramatic business process re-engineering improvements. Let me give you some uh, example, like uh, many of you know, because we are, I'm a, I'm a mother and many, uh, we parents, many, uh, many, many times our children give us a lot of competitive exam. Let us take the example of Olympiad exam. So suppose uh, my child has given Olympiad exam. So what happens to he must he uh, must be getting some uh, like you know medal or something. So we think oh he got some medal one day he brought some medal oh he must be uh, like you know topper in class or second or third like you know this recently happened to me. But then when I got the mark sheet and certificate this is like Olympiad exam I know it may be second or third or first in class but it is like you know state wise national wise there is some ranking so benchmarking similarly this is the benchmarking so it may be we feel like you know i am like our lab we are practicing we are practicing all the quality indicators we are practicing all the benchmarking tools like six sigma lean so we may we may think that we are in the top 25th percentile but when we participate, we know we may be uh, like, you know, it's, uh, we are in the achievement category, but we may be when we are conducting that as a survey wise or benchmarking. So we may be nationally or APEC level, we may have some ranking. We may be in the 50th percentile. I'll show you my lab results where you will understand like, you know, how 
uh, we can understand where, what exactly where in the, all those prawns, we are at the top 25th percentile level and some prawns like turnaround time monitoring. So we used to do lab turnaround time, but never bothered about doing the pre-analytical turnaround time, analytical turnaround time, and post-analytical turnaround time. So this we know by when we participate such kind of survey, we know what are the our KPIs and where we can improve. So this is like PDCA can be one of the tool for continuous improvement. Then Lean Six Sigma ISO 15189 2012 and 2022. This guide us like uh, help us in a broader sense like to follow the quality journey and uh, other tools, a uh, lot of 5S and different other tools which helps us uh, for the different matrices helps us in the continuous quality improvement. So why we need to do this benchmarking so if we see this is uh, like in 2011 181 labs i came to know about this benchmarking survey in 2017 and 2019 around 3235 labs participated and this is now the current survey 2122 survey so we want uh, like you know in this lab insights many labs should contribute should participate so that we uh, like many many times we uh, give those quality indicator or continuous quality improvement uh, we give for NABH we maintain for NABL we maintain an NABH quality indicator you must be sending that to your quality uh, head of the hospital so during that time we need to have that benchmark what is the international uh, standards for redone what is the international standards for uh, dilution or uh, repeat runs so because of that benchmarking helps us to know that international standards so this is uh, only 3235 labs in 2019 so this year we need to have more and more labs to participate this is not for any ivd this benchmarking lab in size, they don't ask about like, you know, which instrument you are using. This can be any IVD, any instrument we can use, but we can participate in this benchmark survey. And from that, the, what is the advantage we are getting from that benchmark survey? We are getting our KPI, where we are standing, what is our target KPI, and how to plan our KPI for our continuous improvement in our hospital or in our lab. So if you see there are around one, two, five, three participants join this. And if you see from different countries, Asia Pacific region, and now more and more country are participating, developed country and developing country. So this is the summary of the report uh, we get. So if you see uh, those who have participated, so you must have got this summary of the report. So these are the legend. So in this, you will see the light color one. So this means you, we are in the uh, 0 to 50th percentile. We are below median bracket. And suppose we have participated and we are good. So this is the medium color. So where this is like 50th to 75th percentile in the epic region and if we are excellent this is the darkest color so we are in the top 25th percentile in the epic region suppose for example if i take this operation so these are the management tools these are the operational workflow tools and these are the productivity and how we know like accreditation external quality control continuous improvement key performance indicator these are management tools so uh, yes suppose i have not participated before participation i used to think i know all of this accreditation we are doing the uh, four accreditation equa we are doing then continuous improvement we are doing some quality indicators key performance indicator kpi also every year we are defining so what more i will learn from this so what more uh, i will learn from this is i know where my like uh, labs what are the weak points where i can improve 
group where there are uh, there are room for improvement and where there are this medium color maybe we are in the 50th percentile but we can have some more improvement and we also know top 25th percentile in the epic so then we can actually make that indicator as a silent indicator many times we are doing the same indicator for turnaround time i used to do that for turnaround time monitoring of the stat uh, for some parameter like troponin so i used to do every year like year after year year after year and we used to have the six sigma like 4.5 99.3 percent uh, of the like um, compliance but with that also we used to do that every year the, that kpi was to take that but uh, we realized with that survey, we have reached that in top 25th percentile last five years. Then it can go for if we have achieved that for last two years, then it can go as a silent indicator. Then I can take something uh, like, you know, critical result reporting may be challenging for us. So I can take the KPI, which is the weakest, and we can start improvement in that KPI. So that is the advantage of benchmarking survey. So now coming to like, it will give you report where you will know, like, suppose this is your lab and this is 180 minutes is for uh, the uh, the reporting turnaround time of routine tests. So, you know, like, you know, all part participants, what is the routine uh, median turnaround time? So this is the box and whisker plot. And India, what is the um, range of routine turnaround time in the a pack or large labs more than 1000 samples per day what is the turnaround time of the large large labs that also it will help you to like you know device uh, this benchmarking survey uh, will help you to devise your KPI, define your KPI how. So like, suppose I am in uh, 500 um, bedded hospitals and I am uh, releasing around 1,000 to 1,500 reports per day, some uh, tests per day. So I know which where I stand. So is it medium, is it small lab, or is it a large size lab? Then I can compare with the peer group who are large size lab or who are medium size lab or small size lab. Being in a small size lab, if I compare with the large size lab, so this will be totally give a wrong interpretation of my KPI. So because of that, this kind of survey helps. So this is our report. This is the summary of our report. Let's see our report. So like we said, I, we have all the four accreditations, NABL, CAP, NABH, and JCI. So in this accreditation, external quality control, continuous improvement, we are in the top 25th percentile. But see the key performance indicator. I used to think we are one of the best in key performance indicator. So whatever anyone suggested, we used to take that as a KPI. But see this we are in the 50th to 75th percentile in the APEC region for key performance indicator. Now the shock of my life I got when I participated in this, this operational uh, excellence survey or operational workflow. So turnaround time in routine turnaround time, stat turnaround time, specific essay turnaround time, we are the in the in the highest level uh, in the top 25th percentile. But if you see the turnaround time monitoring, so we are lacking in that. So we need to, it's not that we are lacking in reporting the test results in particular time. It's that how I'm monitoring the tools I am monitoring so that we, there are a lot of room for improvement. Now coming to the sample processing. So in sample processing, in processing operational workflow, this is the uh, kind of highest in top 25th percentile. But if we see the stat sample handling and critical results reporting, we are in the uh, less than median, below median uh, criteria. But before that, I we used to think that we are doing exactly what is needed for critical result reporting and staff sample handling. Then IT functionalities and middleware, we have both. So this is the current one where we have the middleware also. So where we are standing in between the line, but there are a lot of functionalities are available to us, but we are not using that. 
So there are a lot of uh, chance to improve. So similarly, the productivity of the staff. So this is in the middle zone. Instrument productivity, if you see, this is in the less than 50th percentile zone. And uh, the space productivity and instrumentation, if we see, this is in the highest range. So why uh, this, this is the survey results for our summary results. So here, I never thought about that. This is, I am lacking. I am lacking in those and I'm lacking in instrument productivity. So by participating in this survey, I know like what is expected from my EPEC peer group when we compare what is expected standard and how I can improve what are the tools. So there are like, you know, where is the growth opportunity? I can understand from that. So this is like, uh, as I said, in India, many small hospital like zero to 500 beds, then medium hospital 500 to 1000 beds, the large hospital more than 1000 beds, they participated. So peer to peer comparison. So because of that, we need more and more contribution, like only four large hospital labs are participating in this. So suppose someone is coming from hospital lab, more than large hospital lab, so they are participating. So their peer group data is skewed. So only four or five. So because of that, if there is many participation, so we will get the standard to based on our Asian data or Indian data. So the, this is the advantages of this study. Now the result of the survey, and these are the like you know different publications from the previous survey. Uh, this was in clinical biochemistry, IGCB, and different other uh, articles in different uh, different magazines and uh, different clinical lab news uh, platforms. So this is in clinical biochemistry. So if you see there, uh, they have shown that how to improve in the pre-analytical and post-analytical phase. So if we come to know, like for our case, I showed you like turnaround time monitoring. We were like, you know, perfect in turnaround time we saw, but when it com okay, uh, comes to monitoring, we saw that we are in the lowest percentile. So if we see like, you know, in our case, we were reporting only laboratory. We are concerned about laboratory turnaround time. But when we think about brain-to-brain -brain loop or Ludenberg loop, like, you know, pre-analytical, -pre then pre-analytical, analytical, and then post-analytical and post-post-analytical, like brain-to-brain -brain loop when patients come into clinicians, clinicians ordering the test, and then the, we are reporting the results, and then again, the clinicians creating the results. So clinicians bring to coming to again clinicians brains to this brain to brain loop when we think covering the all integrated uh, workflow. So this we used to all of us maintain that laboratory turnaround time but many times we are lacking in total turnaround time like request time to release time. So what we monitor, we monitor lab tap, but we forget about the request time to uh, release time. So, and coming to, like I said, we are monitoring lab tap, but I never thought that to divide it. In, I was not uh, like aware only that we can divide in pre-analytical, analytical turnaround time and post-analytical turnaround time. What are the advantage? Why we need to divide? Because the bottleneck point, then many times we understand that bottleneck points is not the analytical. So I may be trying to improve turnaround time, analytical point of view, but bottleneck point may be pre-analytical. So there is no need to actually be concerned about the analytical turnaround time. So I need to like, um, do those uh, sigma metrics or anything or any other tools we should uh, do the value added steps and non value added or business value added steps evaluations in the pre analytical or post analytical turnaround time monitoring so this again these are different kpis like sigma value then workspace utilization employee productivity employee satisfaction meter so we used to have some survey but then again scoring when uh, the scoring i saw there is lacking in monitoring of that scoring so uh, through this, I realized that we need like, you know, even employee productivity and employee satisfaction meter, we also can score that. Then coming to cost reduction, overhead cost, then customer satisfaction meter. So the NPS, so uh, the 
NPS, we were never bothered. So then when it come to NPS, customer satisfaction, we started the feedback. We used to have the feedback, not department dividing uh, feedback, like, you know, uh, concentrating to chemistry lab, concentrating to immunoassay lab, concentrating to different other departments. So similarly, EQA program performance course, turnaround time scores. So this by participating in this survey, we can understand sigma value to different other KPIs and we can know like these are my weak points. So I may not be bothered about uh, uh, like, you know, sigma value, analytical sigma rating. I should be bothered about turnaround time monitoring. I should be bothered about my um, space utilization. I should instrument utilization like that or test utilization. So this is again uh, total and developed and develop can, developing countries, the SA laboratory test comparison between different countries and uh, different markers like arterial blood gas, cardiac markers, then CBC, liver function test, renal profile. So how we can benchmark that. So then coming to the pre-analytical automations. So pre-analytical automations, when it, uh, like uh, there is more than 1,000 samples per day. When, then we see that in pre-analytical, uh, some pre-analytical automation may be necessary when uh, the sample size is more and there is a huge workload. So if for that, then we can think about that clinical chemistry or immunoassay pre-analytical automation, can, we can benchmark that and then we can present to our management. Many times it becomes difficult for us diagnostician to present to the management like where we can improve. Where are the different, there are room for improvement. So if we participate in such kind of survey and if we show that these are the effect benchmarking uh, survey where other labs are participated and where uh, like, you know, the around N is equal to 95 for this thousand to 2000 bracket and more than 2000, then we can show how many are parties having this pre-analytical automations and why we need that. So similarly, the diagnostic labs in India investigating quality characteristics, productivity, and time of reporting. So this is the paper in IGCB. And this is uh, if we have some benchmarking in India and also in Asia Pacific region, that helps us. So this is again labs with automated pre-analytical systems and lab volume per FTE. So this full-time employee, how many, what is the test utilization for? employee or proper staff so that we never bothered i think we just bothered about turnaround time professional proficiency and then the operational excellence but lab volume per fte we never cal calculated so this will help like um, specimens per fte or test per fte so that that re will really help help so this is summary of that uh, study uh, the igcb study so where they have taken this like you know automated pre-analytical specimen per FT, test per FT, test per square meter. So this is uh, the median percentile is in Indian scenario and this is in 75th percentile and this is in 25th percentile. So if we see chemistry turnaround time 120 minutes then median is 180 in Indian and 240 uh, in uh, 75th percentile and uh, this is kind of uh, like how many labs are participating and um, what are the samples per FT, test per FT, test per meter square. So this is in different percentile what is the turnaround time, immunology turnaround time, samples per FT, test per FT. So now uh, benchmarking, why? How, like uh, in our case, this is the study, like where we uh, started it when we wanted to uh, implement the benchmarking, the menu, discipline, workflow, speed or efficiency, then quality errors and productivity. We have taken those KPIs as our tool. So like, uh, let's talk, uh, then we started Lean and Six Sigma. So let's talk about Lean and Six Sigma over coffee. So what, like brewing coffee, we all brew coffee, but what is the, why, why we should implement Lean and Six Sigma? So why, where do we keep our coffee pot? Suppose I want to have the morning coffee. So getting up from bed and where we are, uh, I'm keeping my coffee pot, filters, coffee, sugar. So that should be in one place. How many places do you make coffee? So where do you store your supplies? 
near each other it should be so it should eliminate the unnecessary motion and also allow you to refill when needed and reduce time to make coffee so this is called lean and it's not only lean so we need to have a great cup of coffee for that types of brand, roast level, amount, water content, uh, milk content, sugar content. So that makes the coffee tasty. So that is Six Sigma. So this, how can I make a great cup of coffee fast? So that is the implementation of Lean Six Sigma tool. So this is our example. So we stand alone in analyzers. Like if you see, this is our lab. So how much staff motion or sample motions uh, like uh, if you see, and uh, this is uh, in earlier like clinical chemistry and immunoassay lab, hematology lab, and central receiving, and this is now the lean workflow. So how the benchmarking helped us in automate automation and integration and consolidation. Then essay verification and value validation. These are different tools for benchmarking, like precision, sigma metric, overhead cost, and quality. So suppose you are going to your vacation flight to your dream destination. Which pilot you will choose? The first one? Of course, he wants to land on the runway, right? Like now we are going for this Kahu, Lapcon, and Kahucon. Of course, we want to go to Hyderabad, enjoy the session, and we want to land on the runway. But if you see this pilot, there are a lot of very variations. But if you see this pilot, he's always near the target. So how do our process look? It's producing to the target value means we need to change our habits. We diagnosticians, we are sitting in a flight and we are like, you know, uh, the pilot and the clinicians, our patients are the passengers. So the, our clinicians or our uh, uh, patients, they are not bothered which ways guard rule we are implementing in our lab. We, are we implementing one three S or two two S or R four S? Have any time your clinician asked which way is the rule you have applied? Never. So they are not bothered about what quality standards we are implementing. They just want the target value. So that is like, you know, help uh, by that benchmarking helps. So they want which uh, by benchmark standard we are following. So similarly, like this is our lab. So if you see some of the routine parameters I have taken, so this is in the world class, these uh, parameters, these are in the excellent five to six sigma and um, no, no, nothing in four to five sigma range. So this is like some are in the five to six sigma, some are at more than six sigma. So based on that, which when we take those benchmark tools, I know this AST, urea, calcium, we may come to from excellent to the world class. I, 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 if we monitor, if we do something, if we do the business evaluated steps and evaluated steps, we can improve. So because of that, we can improve in those. So similar Similarly, like this, some of the parameters when we have taken. So we have seen like, you know, 17 essays in more than six sigma, five to six sigma level, five essays. So I have taken around. Um, so these are the quality directives, but based on NABL and other ISO 15189. So and other guidelines, we need to like, you know, we have to see the local accreditation committee and they specific. So many times it's not only Six Sigma, we have to see the local regulations too. So similarly, like, like the, this is the Lean Six Sigma project charter for turnaround time of the stack test. So we shifted from uh, like one hour to 45 minutes. So how we have shifted? We have defined evaluated steps and time, non-valuated steps and time, and we have defined our waste and step by step by step. We have seen like what are the non-valuated steps? What are the valuated steps? What are the bottleneck points? And then Six Sigma, we calculated the defects per million opportunity or DPMO. So this is how we calculate the defect per million opportunities. And then we have seen like when August 2014, we have started. We were the compliance, if you see only 74.7% compliance. But we used to say think that we used to we are doing everything uh, for uh, this turnaround time monitoring. So but if we see the compliance was 
around 74.7 percent just simple by simple monitoring of the bottleneck coins we achieved in july 2015 98.1 percent that's uh compliance and sigma rating was 4.16 sigma and then when we improved and uh so in september 2015 um we we were at 99.1% compliance and Sigma rating was 4.66 and 99.3% compliance we achieved 99.5% compliance in October 2016, 4.83 Sigma rating. So now coming to uh, like generalize, we think that, okay, only more than six Sigma is important. If we are at less than six sigma, so there, what is the importance? So I need to achieve. But if when we come, when we see international, so this is the role of benchmarking. So when we saw this, the benchmarking is only 4.5 sigma for turnaround time monitoring internationally. Then we know that we are at the at par international top 25th percentile of the international standard. But otherwise, why we we used to think, okay, our sigma rating is only 4.5. 75, so we have to reach six sigma. So that's not practi very practical approach. So when we realize we are at the top 25th percentile of the sigma rating for turnaround time monitoring, then uh, we started from 2015, 2000, uh, sorry, 2014, then 2015, 2016. Then I used to monitor that for every year because this is one of the easy and this gives a beautiful picture and beautiful demonstration of what we are doing. And it's very easy to uh, like, you know, demonstrate everywhere. But then there is no use of doing whatever we have reached to the top 25th percentile for three years so that there is no use to do this repeated job again and again. So then we make this as a silent indicator. So then, then we have taken another stat chemistry marker for the turnaround time monitoring. So this is the use of benchmarking. So then we realize what are our bottleneck points, how we can improve people, material, machine, environment, and methods where we can identify and we can monitor and do improvement in the turnaround time of lab reports. So similarly, digitalization, how it helped like alerts, algorithm, and then customer satisfaction, productivity, and overhead costs. So this is a small example for AKI, AKI alert. Many of us are reporting AKI alert. And many of us uh, are thinking that we are reporting creatinine, so the why, why, and we are reporting critical alert. But where, why we should do uh, report uh, AKI alert or AKI um, e alert, electronic alert? So this is uh, like increasing serum creatinine more than equal to 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours. Now see how many of us observe in our patient 0.3 milligram per deciliter of creatinine arts, creatinine rays. So I, 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 I don't observe in my patients like 0.3 milligram per deciliter rays of creatinine. Similarly, serum creatinine more than 1.5 times or 50% from so good afternoon. Uh, so let's see from the uh, like one patient, like what is the improvement and how it has benefited. So because each benchmarking, quality, accreditation, everything is dependent on our patient outcomes. So this is from testimonial from our patient. What is it? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Deepika and daughter of Mr. Ramesh Khanna, age uh, 79. And um, we came here almost uh, 25 days back and uh, 26th uh, day before, I was just having, I stay in Dalhousie in Himachal Pradesh. So 26th day or before, I was having a conversation with my pa, and he said that I, you walk very less and I walk almost 7 kilometers a day. And on the 25th day, uh, I got a call from my caretaker that something is wrong and he's not well, there's a lot of fever. I rushed down from uh, Dalhousie to Mumbai. And we brought him to Kokila Bay, and here uh, he was diagnosed of acute kidney injury because of an abscess in the liver. Now, uh, he has always been a very, very fit person, and uh, he's been really taking good care of his health, drinking a lot of water, hydrating himself. So I never thought that this would ever happen to him. Now, what I was told was that, you know, since uh, there's an e alert uh, system and they kept on monitoring his keratin. 
as a result of this they controlled it in time and they did not let this acute injury turn out to be a chronic one had it been a chronic one then recovery would have been very very difficult very painful and time consuming so i'm really thankful to the team of so what is it good afternoon sorry so this is like you know uh, we, this is a pilot study so we when we have shown uh, this in the, around 4700 patients so we have uh, akie alert was raised in 273 patients and true akie alerts after clinical validation was only 239 and false akie alerts were 34 now coming to like you know the akie 239 and uh, in, in this e alert who uh, 273 e alerts raised and uh, around 34 fo uh, false so api so if we see this is the sub group analysis so this is most interesting so this uh, like total patients since 2000s included patients is 1799 and number of akie e alerts was raised in 143 cases a number of patients we documented when we have seen the clinical validation when we have seen the patients report because akie is heterogeneous it comes from heterogeneous group from uh, it's not only medicine or nephrology in it it comes from oncology it comes from icu and different setups and different uh, different worlds multiple worlds so when we have seen we have seen the records of the uh, files of all the patients of 2000 so we have seen only number of patients documented akie diagnosis are 46 and number of patients without uh, we have reported akie is 143 so you can uh, understand the role of uh, implementing the e alert system so this is the role of digitalization this is the role of benchmarking so where the, this can, with, with the help of middleware or any other monitoring tools it can help us to reach that um, that level so because of that digitalization helps is on us in total testing process from pre pre analytical pre analytical analytical and post analytical and each and every process we should monitor and we each and every process there is benchmark so we uh, we may know about the analytical benchmark we may know about sigma ratings of our analytical uh, parameters or the turn in our lab turn around time but we are never bothered from like when the clinician sending the order and when the patients are releasing the reports uh, uh, when we are releasing the reports it's reaching to the patients so that actually counts for the patient satisfaction or nps score so we uh, so total testing process or brain to brain loop or ludenberg loop which is important so because of that this is there is a role of benchmark so this another benchmarking tool is auto validation so these are like for clinical chemistry immuno assay serology so these are different cold point like reference ranges tol tolerance limits or critical ranges then it comes instrument flags and then result flags specific patient history then third uh, is uh, iqc rules sigma wasgard rules then fourth is delta checks then clinical uh, fifth is clinical correlation and sixth is patient moving averages so because of with all those tools when we apply for if suppose we have gone for total lab automation or automation and And integration so where, where where we want to stop where we want to which auto validation rule we we want to apply so because of that if we participate in the benchmarking then we know like you know what is the benchmarking standard in the asia pacific region and what where we want to reach so see uh, this is our outcome uh, with this target outcome is bent parking implementation is simplification like 74% reduction of sample touches and batching real estate saving 450 square feet space free for expansion so this we have already observed then future proof is around 3% capacity test per hour per square feet then reduction of sample draws are 40% reduction in tubes drawn per patient and staff reduction for to run automate automation solution at the peak hour turn around time 60 to 75 minutes for all the tests and uh, 95% uh, production of turn around time touch checking to the results then the minimum 65 5% auto verification we have not applied that so this benchmarking it can be any instrument 
it's not like you know particular vendor or particular IBD. We can implement benchmarking to any X, Y, Z, any instrumentation, any instrument lab, any middleware we can apply. So this benchmarking survey will help us to understand where we stand and how to implement for our lab. So this I acknowledge everyone. And so this painting, so we see the clinicians, but this is like, you know, we are the healer, we are extended health hands. So this, our technical staffs, everyone's diagnostic department have uh, extended hands helps the patient to have the better outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nuru Bernali. I think uh, that was a large, long, uh, comprehensive view of what benchmarking was and where you've applied it in the uh, in the field itself, in the clinics, talking about knowing about clinical reporting and then figuring out what critical reporting was, running it into the field, knowing about what tag to follow and then taking it out. And basically saying like, these are the different things that are used in benchmarking that you need to look at and how you've looked at it, kind of the overall overview. Uh, what? Thank you so much. So I'm going to open the floor to any questions immediately. Uh, uh, thereafter, we will move forward one more presentation, one more demonstration. So any immediate questions? Just to inform everybody, uh, this essentially is what uh, once you log in and when you log on to the lab uh, benchmarking tool, this is something that you will see. Uh, La the Lab Insights is a website that ha serves two purposes. One is to uh, bring about e uh, key opinion leaders across the globe. You'll see here there are a whole bunch of key opinion leaders from the first, the person who invented uh, automatic uh, immunohistochemistry, his story, uh, how they automated instruments for immunohistochemistry to uh, a, a total automation lab in, in Pakistan for that matter, but essentially how they uh, dealt with it. And if you uh, go down, it'll give, uh, these are there are more recent stories and, and it'll give you really key insights to uh, opinion leaders across the board, how they're using different technologies and how they're applying it to change patients' lives. So that's one of one part of lab insights. But a large part of Lab Insights is essentially if you click on the survey and report tool. So once you log on, you'll have access to the survey and report tool. And essentially, there are three surveys that are available. What we're talking about essentially is the first survey. Uh, so once we, if you look at the first survey, Right, sorry. So this is the first survey. Uh, the first survey you uh, like here, this because the survey has already been uh, filled, uh, you, you don't see it highlighted here, but otherwise you can click, you'll get a button like this that takes you to the survey. If you click the survey, you will go into the web page that has the survey. The survey consists of about 30 questions and basically asks you small questions related to uh, quality, uh, speed, uh, or operational workflow and, uh, and productivity. Basically, you'll be filling in different data. The data could be is essentially multiple choice questions and numbers. Uh, these the questions are essentially non-intrusive, so they're not specific to your lab, but they are about your lab in some way or the other. And they'll be able to give us a, a sense of, uh, or they'll at least be able to uh, put the lab up in comparison to the other labs. So essentially, once you fill the survey, your your data goes into a larger pool of data, and what you will see is you what we can do is then. Uh, uh, reflect your data on the larger pool and really come up with a report like this. So like here you can see view reports. So if I clicked on view reports, you'll get a dashboard like this. So as Dr. Uh, Bernali has already discussed the summary report. So here, as you can see in the report, you'll get a summary report here and you will get a dashboard report. So a dashboard report is essentially a detailed report on management, on operations, on, on uh, productivity. So that that that's that's a detailed report here, but let me start off with the summary report. Now uh, this is a, a, a demo a demo account that we've created to show you what reports look like. But as discussed earlier, we're looking at sixteen. Once you fill the survey, you will get a report of sixteen key features of your lab or sixteen areas of uh, evaluation. It could be accreditation, external quality control, continuous improvement. 
and key indi performance indicators in terms of management. In operations, we have uh, one is uh, speed and one is operational workflow. So these are two things that we'll be looking at. In terms of speed, we're looking at turnaround time. In terms of operational workflow, what are the different points in the workflow that are being that are that you are conducting that will help us that 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 will give you a measure about what the larger spectrum is doing? So there are a whole bunch of questions. They're based all on the thirty questions that you answer, but that those are those answers are then back calculated and a score is given to all of them. The last one is productivity, uh, the staff productivity, instrument productivity, space productivity, and instrumentation itself. Now uh, the legend here is very important. Uh, please note that uh, you'll be compared on the latest statistics. So what we do is we take the latest entries of the last two years and we, we put them as the benchmark. So that's why the benchmarks are always current. So you're always compared to the current, uh, the current laboratory scenario across the APAC region. So the last two years data is what we will include uh, in these benchmarks. Right As of now, it's the 2022 uh, data that has been included. So that's where you'll be compared against. So you're comparing against performance levels of current labs in the APAC region. Uh, how do we compare that? In the APAC region, what we're doing is each of those questions uh, are either compiled together or mixed together and then, then measured against the percentile that you score. So you are either in the lower percentile, that's below median. <clears throat> if you're an intermediate color, uh, an intermediate color would be something like this. Continuous improvement here is an intermediate color. Key performance indicator is a light color. So light, uh, intermediate, and dark. So similar with uh, this uh, area here, critical reporting is a light color, routine tad is an intermediate color, and IT functionalities here is a dark color. Uh, in productivity in this, in this particular case, it's all dark colors, but uh, the essence is that if you're a light color, you're uh, within, when you're comparing against APAC, you fall in the lower percentile. So you're below median in APAC. If you compare to uh, if you if you compare to APAC and you're found between 50 and 70 percentile, you will be in the intermediate uh, area. So these would be uh, these would be the colors that you would receive. And if you're in the top, that means if you're top 25 percentile of the APAC criteria, then you would be given a dark color. So each of these will just give you a, a general overview of where you stand on 16 areas of evaluation uh, uh, across uh, management, operations, and productivity. So that's the summary report. To go into the detailed reports, there are two ways to do it. You can click on dashboard, or if you're really interested in a specific area, suppose I'm specifically uh, interested in, a play, in, in the area of routine tab, I can click routine tab directly, and I will go into the statistics for routine tab. Now, please remember, uh, the idea of benchmarking is to say that, uh, is to, uh, to look at a common trait across a large number of laboratories, and uh, and establish where these how what is the variation in those in that particular trait, and then what we do is we take an individual laboratory in this case your laboratory, and that's this is a personal one on one thing for each person who enters. What is the number that you have entered against the largest spectrum of data that has been uh, entered into the survey? So if you can see here, it gives you my lab. It gives you the question. So the question here is uh, the target turnaround. Please note this is target turnaround time not actual turnaround time, this target turnaround for clinical, clinical chemistry that has been entered by a whole group of participants. In this case, what we're evaluating is you've got a peer group selection here. So you can say all participants, you can say in this case, since the participants is uh, the base location is Hong Kong. So that's why you'll have the selection of Hong Kong in the upper in the peer group selection. If I click on Hong Kong, it, uh, it uh, changes the data. So it's online review. I can even go further to develop countries, government hospitals. I can go click through each of them. Now, if I don't want to go through these individual clicks, what I can do is choose, change the filter here. So I say, let the question be on top and let the peer groups be here. Now, I personally, I prefer this kind of layout where I'm looking at the report this way. So the same question, we're looking at uh, clinical chemistry tab. Uh, for this particular lab here, you can see that the lab has entered as 150 minutes. Now, what I'm looking at is all, these are the peer groups that they can be compared with, all participants, participants in a particular country. For your, uh, whenever you see your report, this will change to India. Uh, developed countries, uh, government hospitals, uh, this will keep on changing depending on, on the data that you've entered and uh, your facility. And you'll get a choice to see uh, what kind of participants, or what kind of peer groups are available for comparison. 
Uh, also of important note is the number of participants in that group. Uh, ideally, a score of 30 participants in law is statistically significant. Uh, and the more the participants in the group, the better the uh, better the data. So uh, that's one thing you look at. So in this layer, layer uh, you can look at this is zero. That is uh, uh, in terms of a tat of zero to a median tat of 165. Remember, this is a median bar. I don't know if you can see this. But what we're choosing here to represent is the median bar. So 165 represents the median for all participants in the APAC region. So there is 560 participants. The median value is 165. If I want to change to see all participants, I go on this toggle bar here and go say box plot. In box plot, this, this is personally my favorite way to look at it or it's, it's my preferred way to look at it. So in this case, it really represents the entire bunch of data that I have. And it really allows me to ask multiple questions as to, uh, first of all, what is my median TAT in comparison to the APAC region? So if you notice this, it's it's below the 50th percentile. So in, in the sense, I would get a TAT that is in the lower range. So that's why I would get it in a lighter color. If this was above it, I would get a higher color. Also, I'll be able to compare across the board from different uh, in different against different peer groups. So these peer groups, depending on their size, I can have a comparison uh, uh, for my data versus the peer groups. Now, the questions that I can ask here is that if my target laboratory tag in is 150 minutes, uh, is it the uh, is it uh, good for APAC? If I say good for APAC, yes, it's good for APAC. Oh, sorry, it's good for APAC because APAC is 165. So essentially, 150 minutes is above 50 percent is is shorter than the APAC average. Uh, and if I say, uh, is it good for hosp large hospitals greater than 1,000 beds? Again, this is good because large hospital in the APAC region, there's 157 hospitals larger than 150 beds, have a hazard turnaround time of 180. So in this case, my turnaround time of 150 minutes is actually good. So that's why, a uh, little correction, yes, in this case, because I'm looking at that, I'm looking at a smaller number. In this case, a smaller number uh, is good. And in, in this case, this hospital would do well. Uh, if the values were on the, more towards the left side, in this particular case, because a larger value in TAT means a longer turnaround time, which is not exactly uh, uh, not ideal to have. So that's where it will extend on the side. And the more towards the right it is, uh, the less valuable it is. So essentially, that's the way you could review one of these matrices. You could toggle between, say, stat sample and and routine sample, and you would get the same uh, different representation here. The data would change in the background, and you could review it that way. So essentially, this report stands, stands as an online report where you can immediately have a look at all of the questions that you have. You can uh, review the questions individually, saying that this is what I would like to do. Or you could go with in, go into an individual uh, concept, say, if I was looking at uh, space productivity, uh, consolidation of analyzers versus lab space productivity, if I went on to this, uh, I could look at the same. Again, you'd get different graphs. I can hear the peer groups are above and the question is down here. If I switched it over saying this way, uh, where I'm putting the question down, so my peer groups are now here. And this you can do on the fly. You can isolate it depending on how you want to look at your question. How do you want to read it? Uh, toggle it this way. And essentially, you'll get a whole bunch of data that explains to you where the diff gives you different numbers and give you a different benchmark for different kind of labs. In this case, uh, labs with consolidation and labs without consolidation. So if you look at the light, these numbers in the lighter blue, that's those those represent the lab, labs that are without consolidation. The ones in darker blue are the ones with consolidation. And what you're looking at is a number of samples that are uh, being brought into the lab versus the square meter of the uh, the, the area of uh, working area of the lab. So this is an interesting uh, metric where you're looking at number of uh, uh, samples that come into the lab versus the floor space you've actually got in terms of the real estate uh, uh, factor of the lab. So these are different questions and there are uh, uh, there's a whole host of questions you can ask or that are asked here uh, that you can run through uh, in the lab. Uh, you've got different matrices. It's all in the dashboards. Uh, another note here is the generate uh, PDF report. So that's an interesting. So if you wanted all of this data in a PDF report, you would click on this. Uh, you'd have this choice of getting a full PDF report, which is this, which would be 72 pages uh, for operations, 196 pages for, oh, 72 pages for management. Operations is 196 pages. Productivity, uh, 390, uh, 309 pages. Once you say gener generate the report, uh, a request will be generated. 
all of this will be sent to you via PDF and you can uh, evaluate this uh, at, at your own leisure, but really have a full detailed report on ter in terms of uh, in terms of quality, in terms of uh, in terms of speed, in terms of operational workflow and in terms of productivity. Uh, so this was a short overview of how the reporting interface worked. So you can look at it online uh, dynamically. Uh, you have the summary, uh, as well as you can generate your uh, generate your summary PDF reports all available online. So as soon as this is available, uh, uh, you look at your go back. So if you're you've already submitted the survey, uh, the point would be to go to your survey. Uh, as soon as you see here view reports on screen, if you click on reports, your reports are ready and you can review them uh, ASAP. So that's uh, a little bit on the uh, survey report. I uh, wanted to uh, clarify that there were a few doubts as to how results would come. Uh, this is an online survey report where you're looking at uh, a summary result as well as uh, the dashboard with a lot of detail. Uh, the third part is request for a PDF. And the PDFs are large, so that's why uh, it's on request. So whenever you request a PDF, as soon as you request a PDF, uh, within one to two days, you'll receive the PDFs for your detailed review. Uh, any thoughts or questions? So the first one would be, uh, I think Dr. Banali, I think the first one is addressed to you. Uh, the one uh, here, that was, uh, Dr. Rina has asked, uh, you mentioned auto validation. Will the same apply for auto approval, auto approval of results? Yes, auto approval and auto verification. Many times they are used like, you know, the term, uh, many papers, they use the term as auto approval. So you, you can say that auto approval and auto verification are same. And this are like, you know, rule based, uh, based on your expert, diagnostic expert, we define the rules. So you can start with uh, like reference interval and all. So th that is defined by you. So it's not that some other labs are applying those auto verification rule and you apply in your lab. So this auto approval and auto verification rule is based on customized to your lab and customized and based on the uh, expertise which and uh, customized to your requirement and your lab. So if you... Uh, See, uh, like in um, our uh, setup, we have done uh, like the, the first stage reference range, tolerance range, and critical ranges. So for clinical chemistry, this was the uh, the first step or first rule we applied. So next uh, is the system instrument flags, then results flags, specific patient history is the second hold point. The third hold point is IQC rules, Sigma Wasgard rules, Sigma metrics. So these are the third hold point. Then fourth hold point are Delta checks. Then fifth hold point, clinical correlation of the results. And sixth is the patient moving averages. So these are different hold points in the auto verification or auto, auto, auto approval. So uh, you can decide that we, you just want for the, ref, uh, the rule only reference ranges, tolerance limit or critical ranges. Based on that, you want to set up your rules. So that is your, uh, like, you know, in your lab, what you want to apply and how you want to apply that. Ma'am, just to add to that, uh, from the survey perspective, yes. uh, what we've seen is that uh, the survey over uh, the the use of auto validation or auto approval, essentially the same concept, uh, has been growing uh, in developed countries and in developing countries, and there is an increased uh, use of uh, this concept. The idea is uh, understanding the uh, logical rules. So it's basically it's a, a logic situation. If this is true, then do this and this. Or if, uh, if so, for example, if TSH is high, then follow up with X and uh, do your T4, uh, check your T, so check your the rest of the thyroid hormones. So essentially, what happens is that because these are uh, logical steps that are scientifically validated across the board, you can program this logic uh, into auto validation, and uh, and it really helps in reducing the uh, clutter that normal scores. So essentially, if you have a large a volume of normals that are coming to your lab or, or, or coming from your test results, the, because you are using auto validation rules, uh, basic logic that you would automatically uh, automatically uh, uh, apply to results, those will be applied by the digital logic, uh, the, by the software itself, 
And essentially, it allows you to segregate those normals and release those normals as you would normally do. Again, like Dr. Bernali said, depending on the depth at which you want to go to your auto validation, uh, most middleware allows you significant depth in terms of auto validation, where it's as good or as as uh, your the, the 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 depth at which it can evaluate the rules are significant. So uh, you really have, uh, I mean, it's really uh, it's it's used in a large number of institutes in the uh, in the region. So just just know that bit. Fair enough. Uh, Ma'am, there, there was another one. Please, uh, Dr. Palov says, uh, please suggest a good reference or benchmark for of labs KPI. So you can actually define uh, your KPIs. And uh, if you participate in this survey, you will get many KPIs, which maybe in uh, like, you know, one or two minutes, I can't, uh, I, I, I may forget also. So uh, you can define like menu, uh, discipline, workflow, speed, efficiency, then quality standards, errors, productivity. So all uh, in all those subdivision, you can choose KPIs. So like NPS can be one KPI, FTE, then test utilization can be KPI, then um, uh, this stuff uh, uh, utilization, instrument utilization. So this are, there are actually very well defined KPIs in this survey. So and each steps like pre-analytical steps, there are KPI uh, second steps is analytical steps and then post analytical steps. So each steps you can actually, there are several KPIs uh, like uh, example, I have given the KP, one KPI is turnaround time. So we, we used to do the turnaround time of the lab. A lab turnaround time, but we never used to think about the Ludenberg loop or a brain to brain loop. So this total turnaround time, we never used to count it. Or uh, like I, I, I say that they have divided this as a pre-analytical turnaround time, analytical turnaround time and post-analytical turnaround time. So you can divide your KPI from like, you know, from lab KPI. Along with that, you can shift from total turnaround time and uh, like pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical. Similarly, customer feedback, like NPS scores or feed, uh, feedbacks, there are pa patient feedback score. So you can define your KPI. Second is your mm, mm, uh, like operational excellence KPI. So you can like, you know, productivity of your staff. So you can define the K KPI, measure that KPI. So, and uh, ba based on that, you can monitor. So it's not some questionnaire, questionnaire, score-based questionnaires you can define. And based on that, you can apply those in a benchmark. So if you uh, participate, I think this as this is a free, uh, like, you know, benchmarking survey. So if you can participate that, you will get much, many more KPIs in each of the, uh, like, pre-pre-analytical, pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. You get many KPIs to measure. So which you may not be thinking also to apply in your lab. Right, ma'am. I think that's a great thing because the, uh, the survey, once you do the, I think going through the survey, there are a lot of ideas and concepts that are coming across. Uh, I think there, there's, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to learn what the different um, uh, KPIs are there and, and what, can, what can you do uh, other than- it's Like management, it. there are KPIs like accreditation, equa, then key performance indicator, continuous improvement, then operational workflow, turnaround time monitoring, routine tag, stat tag, specific assay tag, sample processing, operational workflow, uh, KPI, then stat sample handling, critical results reporting, then IT functionalities and middleware, then uh, staff productivity, instrument productivity, space productivity, instrumentation. So this is these are the productivity uh, KPI. So this all KPI and each uh, subdivisions there are much more. So uh, if you go to the report, I don't know if I can open that. Yes. Uh, should I share my screen? No, yes, this is uh, the report which we get uh, after the survey. So uh, this is our hospital. So if you see, this is standard on time monitoring, lab that target for clinical chemistry, then uh, sample registration, sample aliquot, reason for sample aliquot, sample rejection, sample quality check, stat sample handling, critical result notification. So these are how this report starts. The so same, uh, suppose I take this IT functionalities. 
KPI. So this is where my lab is audit trail. This is KPI, sample tracking, archiving, patient result management, uh, floating median, serum indices, interpretations, automatic validation of test results, real-time turnaround time monitoring, TAT monitoring, AI-assisted clinical decision-making. So like many of uh, the lab, like we started machine learning and deep learning based um, some of the parameter risk stratification. So that can, can come in your KPI. Then smartphone notification, KPI dashboard, data export from LIS to middleware, inventory management, there are different KPIs, and then QC report and statistics, the critical results reporting, generalized generation of statistical report, accounting and billing of uh, tests. So similarly, test ordering, uh, there are the different KPIs like external or order entry system. So each and every test ordering KPIs, then add on test sample retrieval. So each has uh, like, you know, different, different subgroup. So with that, you can uh, actually, it will help. Uh, you can see that, is it from India? What is all participants, India, then APAC region. So you will see like, you know, how is your KPI dashboards and how to compare that. Hi. Our next question comes from Pallav Shah. He says, please suggest some good reference benchmark. Oh, sorry, sorry. The next one is Javed, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, yes. Yeah, Javed. Uh, uh, Dr. Javed answer. He says, any benchmarking for pre analytical phase, most bottleneck, as most bottlenecks in this phase. Uh, so he wants to look, talk about benchmarking in the pre analytical phase. I think that's something that we talked about, measuring TAT and things like that. Perhaps you can. Yes, so pre-analytical phase, so uh, as you mentioned, mo most of the bottleneck in this phase. So one is a pre-analytical, like Dr. Richard mentioned about turnaround time. So pre-analytical phase bottle uh, bottlenecks are there because we know uh, like when we uh, talk about like, you know, nuts, uh, nuts station, like I think I have shown that also during my presentation. So like, you know, what are the benchmark uh, and wh where can be the bottleneck? Uh, so like NARS busy with the consultant round, so that can be de delayed. Consultant round takes long time. Then delay in the process of sending requisition. So materials, then slow LIS, HIS, then machines delay in the sample transport, then environment authentication delay, delay in report dispatch, then methods like no proper information to phlebotomist regarding the other uh, sample collection in the same OR, delay in the sample sorting in accessioning department. So if you uh, you are asking about the tools, the pre-analytical benchmarking tools, any tools you can use, Fibes, DMAC, uh, the, like Sigma, uh, turnaround time for pre-analytical, then different valuated steps, non-valuated steps, and uh, business valuated steps. So each and every, uh, in, you just concerned about the pre-analytical phase, so the, you can take care of that. Then similarly, like, you know, it's a sample indices, like how the HIL index can, uh, uh, like hemolysis, ictera, slip, lipemia samples, how you identify that. So these are also pre-analytical um, uh, KPI we can take. So similarly, uh, there are different KPI we can take and each and every tool what we take for analytical KPI, we can Im uh, implement that five bears, benchmarking, brains, uh, brainstorming, lean, six sigma, each and every KPI uh, tools we can apply for pre-analytical um, uh, system also, pre-analytical phase also. I, oh, I think uh, another one would be uh, your reference to the total uh, turnaround time. The fact that uh, pre-analytical, if there's any problems in pre-analytical phase, if you're monitoring total turnaround time, you'll suddenly realize that there is an expanse in turnaround. It's a difficult thing to do because so you're- never actually up. analytical turnaround time is never issue except for the instrument breakdown. So mostly what we get the pre-analytical turnaround time is a concern of for us, like, you know, where we need benchmarking. So if yeah. we are monitoring that, the pre-analytical turnaround time, like here, I realized that we I need to do pre-analytical turnaround time monitoring along with the lab turnaround time. Actually, that is the most important. So the mo moment I know and uh, I can uh, do phase-wise, I think then we can starting monitoring, like I say, showed you from 74 uh, uh, compliance, we have improved in one year, 98 to 99% compliance. 
or uh, from 3.14, we have achieved around 4.73 sigma. So this is just only to identify where we have identified the bottleneck points and we started monitoring. The moment we start monitoring something, then we improve. So right. you can actually apply DMAC, 5S, brainstorming, then uh, all the tools. Uh, the last one is from uh, Tariq and Anonymous. I think it's, 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 a, it's repeated the question. Uh, the question being, what are the criteria standards and importance of benchmarking? So the criteria is like, the, my whole talk is ba based on that, why I, we should take that benchmarking survey where we are uh, like, you know, wh why this is important. Many times we are not very much aware like we can do uh, like an implement benchmarking in our that practice too. Like I mentioned that we do turn around time. I, I was not uh, aware that I am lacking in turn around time monitoring. We do critical reporting, but I, I was not aware like when I was comparing with Asia APAC standard. So I was lacking in that. So because of that, when we have the criteria like KPI, we mentioned in each and every phase, like from quality to operation to productivity, when we define our KPI, then standards is like by your and my participations to this kind of survey, this survey or any other survey. So by uh, if we don't participate, so we will not get any value. We will not get any uh, peer group to compare. So like always when we have any continuous quality indicator or Q, uh, continuous quality improvement indicator. So you will see during the NABH time, we, re, we use that rerun, recheck, that is a quality indicator along with turnaround time and percentage of rerun, percentage of recheck and all. But suppose nobody participates in such kind of survey. So we don't get any uh, like standards for com to compare. So because of that, there are international standards. There are like College of American Pathologists, IFCC has given a lot of standards. So, but with the Indian standards and Asia Pacific standards, which are lacking. So because of that, our PR group data will help us to build the standard and the importance of benchmarking are all this, like where we understand where we stand and how, what to do and how to do. So this which was all those WH questions are the importance of benchmarking. Uh, can I add to that saying that the please, community please. itself, uh, with the community coming together, uh, really defining standards for the community itself. So the, the criteria being that you're a good lab in the community, you, com you integrate as a community, a laboratory community, and really set the standards where you can reflect how the community should actually, uh, what standards the community should achieve. And based on that, really challenge yourselves uh, as a community, as well as individual labs, uh, posting yourself against those standards and really develop. Uh, in this case, the benefit with this uh, uh, survey is that it's both national and international. So we've got community uh, with the vibe, the community that is involved in this is both national and international. So you've got a lot of peers actually setting these uh, or, or answering the same questions that uh, or actually concerns, addressing the same concerns and saying what should be the best. And then from there, use that as a starting point to then really say what is excellent. Absolutely, absolutely. We need to contribute. And here, actually, I was when I was talking, then I remember that Kipling checklist, so which we usually use for the defined phase. So I remember he said, I keep six on his serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. So what is done? What is the purpose of it? why the benchmarking is necessary, why it is done, why it is done this way, and why it is done, is it, uh, there is any historic data for that, when it is done, when would be better, and when should it be done before or after, how it is done, and can it be done better, easier, or more efficiently, or more effectively, and where it is done, and where is the best place to do it, and can it be done in my lab, who does it, how we can do that, and who could do it more easily and economically. So I think this is the Kipling checklist gives us more insights into the benchmarking. That's a nice way to end. Uh, that's the last question. Uh, I don't know if there's any more. Uh, the rest of the comments, Dr. Testa has also commented on the online. So 
Uh, but yeah, well, that's the last question. Uh, thank you so much. Any closing remarks or thoughts to the team? Yeah, I think we need to participate in this kind of survey. So yes, I have seen like a lot of confidentiality when uh, there was question regarding some people when I uh, like, you know, forwarded, they asked about the confidentiality. When I participated, even that was concern for me. But when I, I was participating in this survey, I saw like, you know, there's no, no name mentioned, like which instrument I'm uh, doing the test or what is the instrument name and how much test I, uh, I I am doing and what is like you know standard or my data is shared to any, anyone else if you don't want to share your data you can just share to your management or your team and and uh, say like you know this is uh, you can use that as a clinical audit tool because uh, most of the audit JCI and NABH we have to uh, give the clinical audit presentation. So during this clinical audit presentation, so any any uh, KPI, if you take uh, in the clinical scenario in clinical decision making, and if you use this as a tool, this benchmarking survey as a tool, so we can show like uh, that we can use for audit trail or audit purpose. Also, so let us contribute. And uh, if uh, there is any other questions, you can get. Uh, consult Dr. Richard and you can contact Dr. Richard and Kaho team. And congratulations, uh, Kaho Diagnostic Divisions and uh, Raj Diagnostic India for uh, this survey. Thank you. Uh, so I think with that, uh, we're, we're, we're actually uh, good on time. We give you 20 minutes back of your day. No, Jay Lakshmi, any last closing thoughts or remarks? Oh, hi. So it was wonderful to hear uh, Dr. Banali speak and her experience as well. So it was really nice. And the importance of uh, benchmarking is now known much more clearer than earlier, even for people who are very skeptical uh, uh, skeptical about you know, participating and giving their inputs. I think um, this would be really, really uh, useful. I think um, labs should participate. We should have our own data to benchmark, to compare, and to progress and grow forward as a, as a lab diagnostic, um, you know, division across the country. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, wonderful. Wonderful listening to you, Dr. Vanali. It was wonderful. Thank you.